I asked my pastor one day down in uh, uh, Alexandria, Pineville. I said, Pastor Darrell, what's the number one thing that people come to the altar for prayer for? He said, Doc, most people come to the altar for prayer is financially related. It's financial lady. He said 90% of most prayer requests can be answered through money. Welcome to the Speak Your Success Podcast. What's going on, family? Welcome to uh, another episode of the Speak Your Success Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And on this show, the focus is helping you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, helping you ultimately to speak your success, believe in your greatness, and continue to create the life and business of your dreams. And today we, we have probably one of the best guests. We have the best guest on uh, to talk actually about that. Uh, my father's in town, Dr. Fred Jones. He is the world's only worthologist. He has helped hundreds and I believe it's actually thousands. He's actually helped thousands of authors understand the self-publishing process to put their books out there, to share their stories, to counter those negative beliefs and barriers within their lives, and then help them be able to generate revenue, right? He's gone on record and has said, you know, when we share, when we share our story, we give God glory. So welcome, help me welcome to the Speak Your Success podcast, none other than my dad, Dr. Fred Jones. How are we doing, dad? Good to be here. Yeah, I'm glad glad to have you. Glad to have you. So now take a second, and I want you to introduce yourself uh, to the successors out there, just letting them know a little bit about you and and and, and what it is that that you do. Because I know I, I took took a little bit of your thunder with the introduction, but I'm gonna let you you know I'm gonna let you take it from here. Well, basically, John, I uh, I'm a worthologist. I help you walk in your worth, value your voice, and tell your story. Um, I believe in the power of your story. When you tell your story, you show God's glory. So you can write a book, build a brand, and grow a business. That's basically what I help you to do. Write a book, build a brand, grow a business, and get the six figures in record time. Okay. Okay. And how, how long have you been in this, this, this process of helping uh, entrepreneurs, business owners write their books? I started back in, I think, October of 2013. Uh, 2013, 2014, I got started, and uh, it's going on now about 10 years. I've been in this process of uh, learning, coaching, and speaking, and online business. It's been quite a journey. <laughs> talk, talk a little bit more about that, because you say you've been in business 10, year, 10 years. Uh, well, you say you've, you've been going through that self-publishing process for about mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm. But, but, but talk, talk a little bit more about uh, just the aspect of Cause you said it's been a journey. Talk, talk a little bit more about your journey. Cause I mean, I know even through the past five years with the pandemic happening and we've seen many businesses open, close, you know, file for bankruptcy, all these things and just disappear. So talk a little bit about, you know, what, what has kept you in the game even through the midst of a worldwide pandemic? You hear people say it all the time. It's going to sound trite. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. It's going to be so simple. And, but, but, but so powerful mindset. Okay. I had a mindset and a determination to go all the way through. What happened for me is I heard this lady say years ago, if you want more impact, influence, or income, she said, you know, uh, uh, enroll in her program. Okay. And I was like, what? She said, if you want to work with me, she said, if you want to enroll in this program, she'd be $800. She said, but uh, if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, it'll be $997. I said, did this woman just say $997? She said it again, $997 an hour. And can I tell you, I said, I can't be mad at this lady. I've dropped my American Express card down, and this has been years ago. And mm -hmm. I paid that $800, and then I enrolled in her mastermind and paid $10,000 because I wanted to know how can someone value their voice, and get people to pay them $997 an hour. And John, I, I, I paid for that mastermind, $10,000, and got in that mastermind program and got one client to pay me $10,000 to publish their book. Uh -huh. And then nine other people that year asked me to do the same thing. So I matched, I made my money back. 
Uh-huh. I matched my salary, and then I went on to create a six-figure course called Bestseller Overnight. And when I began to understand how really you can make money and make your money back, when you understand the value of your voice, the value of your time, the value of your story, that $997 an hour experience, learning how to value my voice and to get people to pay me at that rate was one of the best things I could do in business because it, 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 it prepared me to put a premium price on my time. And when you put a premium price on your time, you can buy your time back. So when the pandemic came, when all the crazy political things hit the country and while everybody was freaking out, I was rocking steady. I just kept doing the same thing I was doing because the game came to me. Everybody then, all of a sudden, they wanted to do business online. They wanted to do courses and they were trying to figure things out that I'd already worked out years before. So I was ready for it and God has blessed our business and and, and uh, it has caused me to just really begin to see the real, the solid side of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. I've been in entrepreneurship 10 years. Mm-hmm. I've been at it full time online for eight years because for two years in a row, I matched my salary before I walked away and became a full time entrepreneur. So. It's been a journey, but it's been a journey I wouldn't trade for nothing in the world. Family, I know you're enjoying this episode so far. I know you've been taking in the content, and I hope you're taking notes, right? I hope you're taking notes. But if you have not just yet hit that follow button on the podcast, I need you to hit it. I need you to hit it, okay? Because I want you to be tapped in to where you get the latest episodes. And even when we drop some surprise bonus episodes, you want to be the first to know and you want to be the first to get it, okay? So wherever you're listening to this podcast at right now, Apple, Spotify, wherever, go ahead, hit that follow button so you're tapped in and you get the episodes first. All right, now back to the episode. Let's rewind it back. And you said you paid eight hundred dollars. Was this the first time you invested in coaching? First time I ever invested in coaching. Walk us through, because you said mindset earlier. Walk us through what is going through your mind at this time. As you're sitting here, you hear the woman say, "You got to get in the program for eight hundred dollars." You've never invested in coaching or in yourself at this level before. How do we say? How do we go from where I am right now to putting down a card? you know, uh, burning all the boats. How do, how do we get there if we've never invested in coaching before? If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same result. When you realize that the pain of where you are is not as rewarding as the pleasure for where you want to go, you realize that it's time to make a shift. I was at a tough spot. And when I realized I, 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 I had titles, I had published books, I had positions, but I didn't have the money to match it. And the scripture tells us that a poor man's wisdom is despised. Mm. And when I read that, I was like, oh, my God, who wants to listen to somebody that's pretty much broke? OK, and I wasn't broke. I was making money, but I didn't have anything really to show for it. But I was frustrated. I wasn't fulfilled. I had done all the other things. I had prayed. I had been in church. I had quoted scripture. You know, I learned all that stuff. You know, one thing I learned, preachers will give us the promise, but coaches will give us the process. Mm. Okay. Preachers give us, people dream big. The Lord's going to work it out. My ship is going to come in. Just lay my money at the Bishop feet. I respect all that if that's the way you want to worship God. But spirituality is one thing, but entrepreneurship is another. In church, you can be spiritual, but in entrepreneurship, you better have a strategy. And so (laughs) you better have a strategy. You can get spiritual, but you got to have a strategy. And I came to the place in my mindset at that moment that I needed strategy. And what happened was, as this lady was speaking, it was like everything she was saying was hitting me right in the gut. It was hitting me. She said, if you're not getting more impact, influence, income, she said, it's poor messaging, poor marketing, poor management, poor mindset. And I was like, pour me some whiskey because this woman is kicking my butt. It was like everything she was saying was speaking to my spirit. And there was this connection. And man, I went all in. I mean, when I tell you I went all in... I walked away from a tenured 
professorship. Mm -hmm. I mean, people give a right arm for tenure. I walked away from the practice of law. I began to pull money. And after I saw that I could make my money back after getting into that $10,000 room, after I saw that I could make my money back, I pulled money from anywhere and everywhere to invest in coaching. And I made a decision. At that stage of my life, I was going all in on me. And I bet it on me. And I made the mindset that I would burn all boats, block out all options, and get all the way in. So my mindset was everything else that I tried to do in the past hadn't worked out. And, and I knew I needed to do something different. And this coaching thing spoke to my spirit. And I, and I got excited. And it ignited my passion. And I went all in into coaching. And I have no regrets to this day. So going all, going all in the coaching, you said we first invested into an eight hundred dollar program, eight hundred dollar. Then invested into a ten thousand dollar program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk, talk about that. Talk about that jump because I, I want people just to really understand. You so you went in eight hundred dollars, and from that, was there a, was there a return that you saw? No, there was not a return on the eight hundred dollars. Okay, but I'll tell you what was there. There was an excitement that I had. Mm. There was a sense of connection that I had. There was a sense of alignment that I had. I felt like I was in alignment for my assignment. I felt like this coach could get me there. And she did. I mean, I honor her. As a matter of fact, I want to shout out her name because I am proud of my coaches. And one of the things, John, that I'm learning in this coaching space is that people get coaches and then they don't want to call the name of their coaches. Man, I ain't understanding all of that. I think some of that is a little jinxy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, jinxy, whatever. But but how you can't build an empire acting like a vampire. Okay? <laughs> you cannot build an empire acting like a vampire. And people want to take, take, take from everybody else I hear, but then they don't want to say thank you to the person that laid down the bridge for them to come across. And that was Marshawn Evans. Marshawn Evans Daniels now. And uh, she was Marshawn and Jack. Her husband is Jack. She's Marshawn. That was my very first coach. Marshawn was my very first coach. And uh, the mindset from 800 to the 10,000 was what she was speaking resonated with me. I mean, I knew, I knew it was it. And uh, they didn't have to really sell me. I was sold. I paid the $10,000 online over the phone before I had ever met these people. Wow. I had never met them in person. I was, I was, I had connected with them over the phone, but I was in this eight hundred dollar program, program, this branding class. That's what it was, a branding class. And I did that class, and in that class, it was just such. Uh, it was pretty much all women too. I mean, it was more but one or two guys in the class back then. And I'm in this class, and there was a lady. I posted a question in the comment in one of the groups one time. And this lady put some words out there, one of the ladies in the group, and it was like, oh, my God, those words just spoke to me. I'm like, oh, that was so good. That's so good. And, 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 and then five minutes later, it was gone. And I'm like, oh, what happened to that? They deleted it. They deleted it out of the group. I'm like, oh, my God, what is that? And I remember the lady's name, you know. And then so when I get to Atlanta, I get in this group. I sit at the table. I go to the front of the group. And I'm in Atlanta. This is my first time here. And I said, hey, my name is Fred Jones. She said, my name is, and then she called her name. And I'm like, oh, you're that lady that posted in that group. And sure enough, I connected with that lady. And we had a phenomenal, built a phenomenal relationship. And, 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 and so my coaching journey has just continued to go up ever since then because I got in a good community. I got a good coach. And I got a new conversation. Next level living requires three things. A next level community, a next level conversation, and a next level commitment. And you need a next level coach. Hmm. Okay. So as, as, we, as we talk about, uh, well, how, how, do you, how do you find a next level coach? Because the next level, if, if it is a next level coach, then we would hope that they have a next level community. But if you're out here online, you're confused right now and you're trying to figure out who is the right coach for me. How do you find that person? Myself, I'm a person of faith. Okay. So if a person not in line with your faith values, then that's probably not your coach. Okay. So that's something for me. That's just a priority. Okay. So number one, you listen for some, listen to see if the person, if there's a spiritual connection, 
Okay, spirit is very important. Number two, look to see if there's a substantive connection. If there's any substance, okay, okay, it, 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 are you getting value? Okay, and then number three, look to see if there's any strategic. Is there a strategy that you can use that's going to bring you success? Okay, so look for the spiritual connection. Look to see if there's any substance. Even though people can be spiritual, they can be cannot have a whole lot of substance. And then look to see if there's any strategy. Okay, and if there's strategy there, will that strategy get you to the success that you want? Okay, now those are some tips. But I, you know, as a uh, there's something you want to think about. If you are a single person, you might want a married coach or a single coach. If you're a married person, you might want a married coach. So that's something to come into complete, to consider as well, whether you're single or married, whether you want a male or female coach. Uh, how, do you, who, how do I find someone? I li- ain't never been there. Can't tell going there how to get there. Okay. So if a coach doesn't have a proven record of testimonials or, 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 or individuals that they can put on display who's done what I want to do, then, then, then I don't want to deal with that. But if somebody got proven record and they have been doing this for a while, and another thing that I always like to hear is how much somebody has invested in coaching. If you ain't invested nothing in coaching, then you're not going to come in and show me how to go and build this million dollar business if you haven't invested. So I look at a lot of different things when I'm uh, getting ready to decide a coach. But the main thing is I look for alignment for my assignment and I look for that alignment in spirituality, in substance and in strategy. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I mean, I've, I've also seen that with with the coaching that I do. I've also seen that there are individuals who, if they haven't invested in coaching, then they're the ones who want to barter. Oh, yeah, it, 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 it's always the people who are, and I want to be careful how I choose my words, but those who haven't, th- th- those who may not have the finances or they don't see the value of your program, which is fine either way. Those are the people who want to this for that type deal. Let, you know, let, let's, let's trade programs or let's trade services versus just somebody paying you the price that you say your program is and then getting in and then getting the value that they desire. Those people most time will not make it. They'll fall into that percentage of people that just fizzle out because they will find a way or a reason or an excuse for not fulfilling whatever terms it was that they came up with. But if what I found for myself, I can speak, and I can speak to the people, the clients that I've worked with, more times than not, the clients who go and find the money and pay in full, up front, and get all the way in, get the best results. I've seen it over and over and over again. Not saying that you can't pay on terms. You can. Nothing wrong with that. I believe in it. But if you're serious about coaching and if you want to set a high standard for your business, then you pay in full because you're going to get what you give. You got to be what you want to see, give what you want to get and live what you want to leave. Other words, you got to be the model of what you want to make, because if you don't model what you want to make in others, then 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 you you're a hypocrite. And you got to operate in integrity, too, because I've, 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 I've noticed that with with my business, I operate in the highest level of integrity. If, you know, if, if, if like I didn't give somebody access to the program, they're like, John, you, I've been locked out two weeks. I'll give them the two weeks back. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to shortchange nobody or nothing like that. But I've realized that by doing that, it has created that level of client for myself, mm-hmm. right? By, by having people who want to operate in integrity and having, you know, the type of clients that are grateful to be there. If, Sometimes, and I know you've probably, you've seen this as well, but you have clients that be like, oh, I'm sorry, I, c- I couldn't make the call today. I'm going to miss the call. It's like, you know, it, you paid. It, that's on you. Uh, but, but either way, it, it, it's just them showing that level of respect for the community, for the program, and for your time. You can only receive from a coach to the level you respect that coach. You can only receive to the level you respect. Respect is very important because when a person becomes disrespected, they're going to be divisive, they're going to be destructive, they're going to cause dilution to whatever you're doing when there's not that respect. Respect is big, big, big in coaching. 
So we, we're, we're talking the other day uh, about the amount of people who don't finish books. Hmm. You, you, you know, you, you've worked with, I don't know how many authors you've worked with. Um, and I mean, I'm, I've seen the graphics because, you know, when we work together uh, and, you know, we still work together now, but seeing the graphics of all the bestsellers come through there and seeing just printing bestsellers. Why? It, what is the biggest barrier that you've seen barrier or barriers that you've seen for why authors can't finish books or aspiring authors can't finish books? Distractions. I'll give you three. Not necessarily in order. Distractions is the biggest one. They get distracted. They lose focus. And distractions are the death of your dreams happening in slow motion. Number two reason why many authors don't finish writing their book is their why is not big enough. They don't have big enough why. My very first book, I wrote was about my father's business, the life and wisdom of Mose Jones, my dad, your granddad. Geneva, my sister, your aunt, came to me one day. She says, Frederick, you really need to get that book finished before daddy dies. And I'm like, oh, gosh. She's, you know. And sure enough, I got that book finished. And then uh, it was December of 2006. Had a big event in Atlanta, Georgia. And after a big event in Atlanta, Georgia, Daddy came back to me and said, now this here, this ain't right, this ain't right. He was very thankful, very appreciative. He said, now this ain't right, this needs to be changed. Matter of fact, he burned up 300 books. He burned up 300 books because they wasn't right. I didn't say Mr. about some of the other people in the book, and I didn't show the level. He burned those books up because they wasn't right. It was May. I rewrote the books, re-edited them, got them all right. It was May or June that daddy looked at those books and he said, now this is right, this is right. And he approved those books and he, he loved those books and sold those books out of his truck. He said, now this is right, this is right. Very, very proud. November 2007, daddy died. So your why has got to be big enough and you don't want to be living with regrets. And I've seen so many people live with regrets. They get sick and they, they regret. So number one reason they don't finish is they, they get distracted. Number two, their why is not big enough. And number three, they don't have an accountability partner. They don't have somebody or a coach to hold them accountable to get it done. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Because, I mean, I have, you know, I've written two Three, if you count the ebook, a couple. Of, I've written four books because mm -hmm. you helped me, mm -hmm. right? You helped me. Both of them became bestsellers with the uh, with the paperbacks that I did. Uh, but I have another one I'm working on right now, and it's been sitting in my backpack mm -hmm. for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. I went through, made rough edits, and I need to go back and put the edits in the computer. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you're right. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't taken that time and been like, "Hey, Dad, I'm working on this book," or I'm "Working on getting out another version of this book." So you're right. All those things are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's help, 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 help the people out, though. Help mm -hmm. the people out. Somebody is listening right now. Somebody is watching right now. They're saying, I hear Dr. Fred. I hear him talking about these books. I hear him talking about why people aren't getting books out. Somebody is listening. They're an entrepreneur. They're driven. They're determined. Can we, can we help the people out? And can we tell the people how they can get a book published? Yes, you can get a book published fast if you want to get a book published fast. You just go to kdp.amazon.com, kdp.amazon.com, and go there and set up your Kindle Direct Publishing Company, okay? Put in your bank account information, your name, and put in your social security number. You got to pay the taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, set up your Kindle Direct Publishing account. Then once you get your account set up right there, then you go to the next page, and it's going to hit the button that says Bookshelf, Create, and just create a Kindle ebook. Don't try to write a paperback book first. You, don't, you, 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 you will not need a back to the book. You just All you need is just a, a cover and, a, and the content. That's all you need. If you really want to get a book published fast, just you just do the cover, do an e-book. And an e-book is just one inch away from a print book. Once you get the e-book completed, then you just put a back to it. And now you got your paperback book. But kdp.amazon.com will get you a book published fast if you want to go there and get the book published fast that's the quickest way i know and by the way 
uh, uh, Amazon is the largest book distributor in the world. And uh, it's, it's the number one go-to. It started off as a book company, okay? So people get Amazon. They, 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 I don't know what it is about hating on success. Uh, we we sometimes want to put down on, on companies that are successful. But Amazon is the largest book distributor platform out there. And for everyday people who want to get a book published, who want to become a bestseller, who want to start a business with a book, there is no better way to do it than on Amazon. I am, I'm exclusively publishing on Amazon. So kdp.amazon.com, you can get a book started there fast. Pause. All right, so Amazon, you just said, you know, that the fastest way to go and publish a book, kdp.amazon.com, and that's the process you've walked me through. That's the process I paid you $5,000 for, actually. The process I paid you $5,000 for. Listen, <laughs> listen. Amazon's the biggest bookstore in the world. One of the fastest ways we can publish a book. Mm -hmm. When it comes to individuals challenging the credibility of an Amazon bestseller, <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts around that? You have the right to be wrong. That's, that's my first thought. You mm. know, people have the right to be wrong, number one. Number two, the most expensive thing you'll ever pay is attention to the wrong people. Number three, real power is the power to define. Go a level deeper. Amazon bestseller is a bestseller, period. Oftentimes, we misunderstand the word itself. The word is bestseller. It's not necessarily best book or best writing, even though I'm not saying that Books on Amazon are the best written or the best, or, you know, authors and so forth. That's totally up to the eye of the reader, okay? But bestseller on Amazon is the best thing since compounded interest. <laughs> if you want to coach, speak, and build a brand based on authority that's established through your voice and you writing and publishing a book and making it a bestseller, it's the ultimate shortcut for somebody who wants to start a business profitably. Well, let me just speak for myself. I took a 99 cent ebook and turned it into a six figure course and ultimately a million dollar business that has afforded me the opportunity to walk away from the academic as a professor and from the practice of law. And I've helped hundreds of other people do this successfully and have gone on to uh, build a brand, grow a business based off Amazon bestseller. So Amazon bestseller is as real as any other bestseller when you accept it for what it is. It's a bestseller because their system of calculating books and bestseller is different from someone else's system or another system that doesn't different doesn't mean deficient. Different mm -hmm. is different. And if you choose to believe that difference is deficient, then that's your problem and not Amazon bestseller or any other bestseller's problem. That's just a problem a person has within themselves of choosing to discount or attempt to minimize something. You discounting it and minimizing it doesn't change the reality of what it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a firm believer in Amazon bestseller. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people do it and it's well accepted internationally and uh it's something that people really <laughs> it's a it's a moot issue for me really because when you just look at the word it means best 
seller mean the number of books that sold the most at some given time according to their system of calculating. Every bestseller has a calculating system. Every game has a method of keeping score because soccer keeps score different than football doesn't mean that soccer is less than football or basketball is more than baseball because they keep score differently. It means it's just a different game, but they both still are athletic events are both still are sports. Same thing about Amazon bestseller or any other bestseller. They just keep score differently, but the two are still legitimate bestsellers. I think you explained that better than I even imagined you would. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, and, and I'm, I'm even a product of that, right? I mean, I'm a product of having uh, multiple bestsellers. And by being able to leverage that book, which I've sold, I don't even know how many copies, uh, pro probably sold over, like between speaking and between, well, in my business as a whole, by writing a best-selling book, then leveraging that best-selling book to having a six-figure business between coaching, speaking, book sales, like everything that I've done. So yeah, I don't have nothing bad to say about Amazon bestseller or Amazon at all, right? Yeah. Because it's been, I mean, I'm, I've, I've profited from the Amazon system. Well, really your system through Amazon, but I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. You spoke as a result of your book, you became a bestseller. You have spoken at how many different colleges? And I've, I've spoken uh, over a hundred, hundreds. I mean, I don't even know. Like I told you, I was looking at the numbers. I need to go back and really tally them up. But I mean, literally from California to Rhode Island. But these are not just colleges. These are main predominant universities. Can you name about three of the top universities that you've spoken at? Uh, so the University of Florida uh, spoke for a Clemson uh, male, male Summit, spoke for University of Rhode Island, uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, we can go TCU, uh, SMU. We can go down and the these line. These were not free speak engagements. These were paid speaking engagements. So, yeah, so going through these processes, these have been paid opportunities. Yeah, I've, I've been paid and to. Southern University, Baton Rouge. And University. Southern, Univer Southern University, multiple times, uh, you know, ha have been developed relationship down there. So, yeah. You even spoke at Northeast Louisiana University or the University yeah, of Louisiana. Yeah, I did. University of Louisiana Monroe. Monroe. Where I graduated from. Yeah. <laughs> All based off of a best selling book that started and was published on Amazon called Correct. Process. Correct. I mean, come on. It's, yeah. if, if, if you're going to try to convince me of that, it's a little late. Um, you know, this idea of, of minimizing Amazon bestseller. You know, I mean, it's a little late for that because it's just been proven what you can do with that bestseller status. And, and this, this, is the thing, this is the thing for me in the coaching space. When a coach has a system, and I'm, this is general because it's, it's going to be general, oftentimes... They try to discredit every other system because they want you to go with their system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though, even though if your system is as sweet as you say it is, you don't necessarily need to discredit other systems. It just can, the, 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 the proof will show. Let it stand on its own. Let it stand on its own. The thing speaks for itself. The thing speaks for, what's the uh, Alvin... Toffler quote. Alvin Toffler, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. The illiterate of the 21st century will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, learn, and relearn. Learn. It's enough for everybody. You don't have to, anytime you have to put somebody down to lift yourself up, you know that you are uh, fallen. Other words, you got to be down in order to hold someone else down. It's so important to just lift up people and encourage everybody because there's just enough for everybody. 8.5 billion people in the world. And if a percentage of those people showed up and knocked on your door for your thing or whatever you're offering or whatever program you're offering, it would overwhelm you. It would, it would just blow you out. So mindset is so important when uh, you're out here and you gotta stay positive and not compare or compete. You know, the only person you should be competing with is yourself. And to be better a person of yourself 
to tomorrow than you were the day before. So that's critical. So going through this, how do you balance out the market and ministry? Right, because because, because I, know, I know now where you are in your in, in your faith walk, and I know we've talked about this many times before, is just how you have now really been lit ablaze in your faith journey. So you being an entrepreneur through and through, and now you also being lit ablaze in your ministry aspect or in your faith walk, how do you balance the two? The first thing you got to do is unlearn a lot of things that's been taught to us in churches and about ministry, uh, you know, all about money. Unfortunately, we've had some real negative teachings about money. When Jesus uh, got his disciples, I believe all of them was businessmen. Mm, all of them were entrepreneurs. All of them was entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. fishers, mm -hmm. tax collectors. You know, they they were doing something. Carpenters, they they they, they were they were they were doctors. Because I think Luke, Luke, Luke was a doctor. doctor. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. Yeah. They're all businessmen. So first off, accept the fact that it's okay to be a businessman and a ministry man. Mm. Okay. So when I went to law school, I put the rest that it's okay to be a lawyer and a minister. I had to really wrestle through that one. Some people say, "How can you be a lawyer and a preacher?" They was like, "Those just that, that's all in water. It's not gonna mix." Well, I worked through that thing, you know, because I, I got clear that you can be, and it's not my job as a lawyer to determine whether uh, a defendant did or didn't do a crime. Mm, you're not the judge. I'm not the judge. I'm mm. the lawyer. My job is to find every right that the law provides my client. OK. And so when I stay in my lane and do what I'm supposed to do as a lawyer, then I can do that without running afoul to what the word of God says. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So so I'm not the judge. So now when it comes to entrepreneurship and business, as opposed to in marketplace ministry, I realize that the two go hand in hand. The two go hand in hand. The more effective and the more successful I am as an entrepreneur the more credibility I bring to my ministry. And mm -hmm. one of the things that has rent run a lot of people away from ministry is that we ministry has been presented as a handout. We, we always wanted people to just give to the ministry, give to the ministry. And I believe in giving to the ministry. I believe in the tithe and, and so forth. Matter of fact, I believe in the 90, 10 tithe. OK, give 90 to the church and live off the 10. But but oftentimes we've 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 had a bad mindset around that. And people have taken a negative approach to it because the ministry has always come across as give, give, give to the ministry. And we've spoken down on entrepreneurship. But I've realized that that's backwards. So I see entrepreneurship as the gateway of ministry. As a matter of fact, my life mission is to know Christ and to make him known through, entre through coaching and entrepreneurial evangelism. Just bring the two together and serve the people. And I asked my pastor one day down in uh, uh, Alexandria, Pineville, I said, Pastor Darrell, what's the number one thing that people come to the altar for prayer for? He said, Doc, most people come to the altar for prayer is financially related. It's financial lady. He said, 90% of most prayer requests can be answered through money. I said, okay, I, I, I can see that. He said maybe even more than 90%. Wow. Most people are praying for money. And I found that, that so often we've developed this conflict around having money. We've just been twisted around having money. And that's bad. And so I've worked through that. God ain't mad at me for having money. And uh, all this business about the love of money is the, the money is the root of all evil. Well, it, the Bible talks about the love of money. No, you shouldn't just love money. You should love God. Because it, when you put money in its proper space, then you will attract as much of it as you can. Because money is simply a certificate of appreciation. That's all. And the people who say money can't buy happiness, you know the rest of that. They just hadn't given enough away yet. Hmm. Money is a vehicle that allows us to serve God, I'm going to say, more effectively because you can build more schools, you can 
buy more medical supplies. You can do more mission trips. It's just so much more you can do with money in the kingdom of God if we had more instead of this poverty mentality and having this negative approach. Well, that ain't about the money and uh, uh, it ain't about the money. You just need to get real because, you know, how many of you go to work every day and tell the people that you're working for, don't pay me, just keep the money, just keep the money. We don't do that. Mm. So we got to get rid of this conflict in our mind. Me, I done got rid of that conflict. <laughs> and I got rid of that conflict by investing money in me and then understanding what the scripture says. Go into all the world and make disciples. How are you going to go if you ain't got no money? You can't. You got to ask your boss, can you go first? Yeah, you got to get permission. You're not free. Mm. Man. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's real. And I would agree. I, 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 would, I would definitely agree. Oh, man. Because you, you wouldn't have the opportunity to be down here, you know, spend time with your, with your grandson uh, and spend time with, with, with me and, and Gabby. If, you, if you, you, didn't have, you weren't able to buy a ticket or if, you know, you had, to, you had some other commitment that wouldn't even make that be possible. Let me flip the script. Mm-hmm. What is it about podcasting that excites you, that ignites you? How did that get started with you? How did that get started with me? The goal initially was as I was leaving Richland College, my alma mater, I just got through speaking and I wanted to be able to extend my reach. I wanted to be able to be other places than just the location I was speaking in. So I wanted to start a podcast. <coughs> One, because Gary Vee was saying, you need to do a podcast, need to do a podcast. But further than that, I began to learn that I could replicate myself or I can multiply myself because I can be speaking in Dallas, Texas, but somebody in New York can listen to me giving the same message or a different message at a different time in their ears. Podcasting is intimacy on, at scale. Very rare. We have to be careful of what we put in our ears because what we put in our ears goes directly into our mind. And what we put in our ears will help us create emotions. And then those emotions will cause us to do certain things. Podcasting, typically known as audio. So therefore, you're putting this in your ears and it's going directly into your mind. So therefore, what are you feeding yourself? That's why I started podcasting, because I would speak your success. I want to help people speak their success, believe in their greatness and continue to create the life and business of their dreams. Why? Because we're created by a creator and therefore we have the ability to create the life and business of your dreams. It says it says in Genesis, we're creating the image of God. So hence all the speak your success, believe in your greatness. And create that's that's biblical. I want people to create. Noah was out here creating a boat. David created a slingshot that slayed a giant. Jonathan, he's seeing these visions. He's speaking these visions, letting people know what's possible in their life, what's gonna happen in your life. How's this gonna happen? How's that gonna happen? That's why I'm so excited about podcasting. What do you make happen for the people that work with you? Talk to me about some of your most successful clients that you've worked with just just give me one just pick someone who's done a phenomenal job and taken the things that you've taught and they've executed i know that there are many but just give me one i'll give you a couple so uh one so there's there's dr Derek burgess dr Derek burgess he wanted to speak more before we start working together he he might have done one-off speaking engagement over the course of a couple of years after we worked together then he was able to generate five speaking engagements within a month then we go down the line, we have Dr. Miriam Smith. She, she is one of my clients, also one of your clients, right? She was able to leverage what she knew um, through her podcast. Then she was able to generate her first thousand dollars in her business. Then we have Ed Jones. Ed Jones, player development professional, work with colleges and work with their athletic departments. Before working with me, he didn't generate, he, he had a book, put out a book, uh, the book didn't sell as many copies as he wanted to. I'll, I'll let him share the number that it sold, but he didn't share as, sell as many copies as he wanted to. We started working together. He started the podcast. He got consistent. He was able to generate 
15 plus thousand from his first conference he did. Then circle back, did another conference the following year, made that again. All by leveraging the podcast. And now it, it seems like every other day he's hopping in, or every other week at least, he's hopping in the group saying somebody else found him. He just locked in a speaking engagement based off his podcast and has locked in a couple of more this past week. This past week. So th- these are these are my clients who they've listened to what I've said. They followed the blueprint. They've seen results. So not only have your clients uh, followed the blueprints and gotten the result, there's another figure. Uh, there's a football team out of, uh, I believe, Colorado or someplace that now uh, is going on implementing a podcast into their football program. Now, you, I believe, said years ago that all of these departments should have uh, a podcast. Tell me about when did you start speaking that? How long ago were you speaking that? And then tell us, tell me about this latest university that's got a podcast. 2021, I went on record and I spoke at the LSU Student Athlete Support Summit. And I said, I believe, I said, the presentation was entitled, Why Every Student Athlete Needs to Have a Podcast. Why Every Student Athlete athlete Needs to Have a Podcast. I believe every student should have one as well. Uh, However, I believe every student athlete specifically should have podcasts because of the individual that goes into the phone booth for a frame of reference, right? Before is one person. Then they're going to come out Superman, Superwoman. Here's why. They're going to develop you holistically. So it's going to develop you in terms of critical thinking. It's going to develop you in terms of time management. It's going to develop you in terms of building real connections with people. And these are all things, and there, there's others as well, but these are all things that you need when you enter the workforce or when you enter the next phase of your life. If you're going pro, great, go pro. And there's no coincidence that we see now more than ever before We have all these pro athletes, Steph Curry, LeBron James, Peyton Manning, and Eli Manning. They have media production companies. Each and every athlete out there, entrepreneur out there, are their own media company, if they accept it or not. If you don't have a podcast or don't have your own platform, you're putting content out on Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, LinkedIn, pick your platform. But you're just giving all of these platforms You're just giving them your intellectual property while you can have the podcast and you can have full ownership of that intellectual property. You have full ownership of this platform. You can begin to generate ad revenue dollars and then you can leverage this authority and expertise to then put out a book because you've built an audience to then go and do a speaking tour. Go do a a show tour, a podcast tour where you're now selling tickets. And this is all coming from what? all coming from the idea or the atom of a podcast. So are you saying that once you build a podcast, you can create your community? And once you create your community, whatever you want to launch or serve to that community, you, you, you got it right there in your hand. So you're saying if you want to roll out a book or if you want to launch a course or if you want to do an anthology project, you already got the audience Basically, you're saying that a podcast is a digital platform for basically printing money when you do it right. A podcast is definitely a digital platform for printing money. I believe and, that. I and then that. Let's, let's take it a step further. Sponsorship companies are no longer looking for no longer looking for the celebrities and the entertainers as much as they once were. Now they're looking for micro influencers who have an engaged audience, i.e. a community, because if I have an engaged audience and I tell this audience to go do this or go do that and then they do it, that's more valuable for me giving that person whatever amount of money versus me paying uh, an athlete, an entertainer who might be an A-list celebrity with the hopes that they can drive engagement. Here we have a proven record that these people can drive engagement and these people can drive conversions versus hoping and wishing up here that if we get X, Y, Z individual to jump on board, that that our dollars are going to convert. Where do you see the future of podcasting going? The future of podcasting now is going to where. 
major company. Some some have already begun to do it, but but it's going to it, it's going to the point to where companies are strategically doing series, so they'll do limited series to roll out a launch. And the reason why is because it's more cost effective. It's more cost effective to roll out a launch of a product, i.e. McDonald's did with a Saskatchewan sauce a couple of years ago. They did series leading up to the rollout of the sauce. Why? Because it builds anticipation. You tell the story. You tell the story of the sauce. You tell the story of people who drove from Texas to Wyoming just so they can get the sauce and experience the sauce because it was so great. So now if I'm hearing this, I'm like, I want to try the sauce. I've participated in the things that McDonald's has done. I want to be the person that. So now people are be, being able to roll out products. Um, people after shows and series. Now, after the show, how do we continue to market the show after the show is already gone and we've done the series and we've done the final, uh, the final premiere? People have to continue to talk about that. How do we create these conversations? We'll take two of the people from the show and we'll start a podcast based off of the show, talking about some of the things that people don't get to see behind the scenes. So now the conversation is still going on about the show. Now it's going to cause people to say, hmm, let me go back and watch that. I didn't notice that in this episode or that episode. So people are using it to roll out products. People are using it to uh, continue to keep people engaged. But even further than that, I believe the future of podcasting will eventually supersede social media because you have complete ownership of the content you're putting out versus when you post stuff on Instagram and everything like you're, you're renting space. Mm -hmm. Instagram can block your account, take all your followers, everything like that. Podcasting allows you to have more of an intimate one to one to many connection while also a one to one connection. Because if I, how I frame my content, if I say, hey, such and such, and I make it seem like I'm talking just to a person in a conversation, as they're listening to it, they feel like I'm talking directly to them. So it's, it's putting relationships on steroids. Wow, that's awesome. That's incredible. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I'm trying to flip the script. I, got, I, 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 well, I, want, I, want, to get, I want to just ask you these two questions sure. and we're going to wrap it. We're going to wrap it. <laughs> so there, there's, a, there's a segment on our show uh, that we do, uh, and it's called Who's Coming to Dinner? And I give you the opportunity to pick three individuals, living or, or dead, uh, so you can invite them to dinner to where you all can have a conversation and talk about whatever, you know, whatever you would talk about. So who would be three people that you would like to invite to dinner for you to sit at the table with them and have dialogue? Three people. Three people. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hadn't thought about that one before. But I'm gonna, gonna I'm gonna go on record for saying number one, Barack Obama. Uh, number one, uh, another person that I would sit and uh, have a conversation with would be um, Johnny Cochran. Um, yeah, Johnny Cochran, and um, the third person that I would want to sit and have a dinner conversation with is. Um, um, hmm, 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 hmm. I'm gonna say Kamala Harris. Barack Obama, Kamala, Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. and Johnny Cocker. I, I want to hear just a little bit about what, like, what do you think y'all would be discussing? Barack Obama, I would uh, want to hear about the transformation. How did his life change once he became president of the United States of America and to what it is today? And after, how, what, what was that change? How did he transform? How did his family transform? You know, what, what did, how does he see the world now? And, 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 and uh, yeah, uh, what's his op outlook on the world? How does he feel about it? Because he had to see the ugly, the nasty. He saw so much hatred and so forth, and the fear of his life. That would be just a phenomenal conversation right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would love to see that with him. Uh, Johnny Cochran, uh, 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 he mastered the law uh, uh, as far as the, uh, his legal paralysis, his legal skills were second to none 
And the man was just a brilliant mind. I mean, Johnny Cochran was just smooth, okay? I would love to hear how he sees the legal system and, and I would love to talk to him about criminal justice and, and, and what's going on with the legal system. Kamala Harris, um, I, I, I chose her uh, being the first African-American female vice president and being that close to the presidency of the United States, I would just love to hear a woman's perspective. It would either have been her or the Justice of the Supreme Court, or, or Harris, uh, I think it's Justice Harris, the black Justice of the Supreme Court, either one of those two. I would just love to hear what's it like for a woman to pierce the veil at the highest level, mm. at the highest level in America. I like that. So we're going to get to the final words in just a second. But before we get out of here, I want, to, I want you to be able to let people know where they can find you, follow you, connect you, all that good stuff. DRFredJones.com. Just go to DRFredJones.com uh, and you can find me, follow me, and connect with me. I do a first book challenge or a self-published challenge. So, uh, and it's a free challenge that's sponsored by my law office, Fred Jones and Associates LLC, keeping the public inspired and informed uh, because I believe that your intellectual property of a book is so important and the public needs to know about it. So my law firm underwrites this challenge. It's a totally free challenge and you can find it at drfredjones.com, drfredjones.com. It's a self-published challenge or a first book. Gotcha. We'll be sure to put that down in the show notes. You, you shared a lot of value tonight, Dad. Uh, what would be your final words for the people? And mind you, this is Speak Your Success. So this is the entrepreneurship community. These are those people who who may have had some level of success, uh, but they're still striving for more level of success in this entrepreneurship space. So what would be your final words for the people? The final words that I would say to this audience, your people, is the most expensive thing you'll ever pay is attention to the wrong people. Now, with that said, I'll say this. Find a coach that you can connect with and stay connected for at least 10 years before you let go. And you'll have success. Don't flip-flop all over the internet. Don't get distracted. Don't get mad. I got one for you. Psalms 119 and 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing offends them. I would say to every coach, every entrepreneur out there, don't be offendable. Don't be offendable. Because when you get offended and you get an attitude about an experience, it throws your equilibrium off in business. It throws you off. You got to stay positive. You got to stay uh, proactive. And you got to take responsibility for everything that happens in your life. Be 100% responsible for everything that goes on in your life. You'll succeed. But be careful and don't listen to the wrong people. Listen to people who've been there, done that, and are proven. Well, there it is. There it is. Well, Dad, thanks for stopping by. You know. Oh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thanks for stopping by. Uh, so that's going to wrap us up on uh, this episode of Speak Your Success with Jonathan Jones. And this has been a Speak Your Success media production. Uh, and everybody out there, remember, 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 uh, be sure be sure to go check out the links that we're going to drop down in the show notes for my dad. Because if you have not written a book, I believe that a book is one of the four legs within your business, right? You need a book. You need to be speaking, you need a podcast, you need a TEDx talk. But other than that, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Uh, I strongly encourage you, if you got value from this episode, be sure just to drop something down in the comments below on YouTube. And I'm Jonathan Jones, and this is Speak Your Success. So please remember, speak your success, believe in your greatness, and continue to create the life and business of your dreams. Why would you and why should you live any other